The journey of a patient with lung cancer involves four major steps. First, their lung cancer is diagnosed, then it's staged, then treated, and then its response to treatment assessed. Radiologists play a major role in at least three of these four steps, and the one role we'll be focusing on in this presentation is staging. When we stage lung cancer, we're describing the cancer's growth and its spread. And the reason why we stage cancers is to establish the patient's prognosis and to determine what their treatment plan should be. With lung cancer, there are five treatments that we can potentially offer patients. Surgical resection. Surgical resection is the only one of the five treatment options that provides a possibility, but certainly not a guarantee of a cure, where your patient has the possibility of eliminating all of the cancer cells and not just 99.9999% of them from the body. It comes with the risks of any major procedure in the chest and is not an option for every lung cancer patient. In order for surgical resection to be effective and provide the patient with a survival benefit, no microscopic tumor should be left behind. If you know it'll be impossible not to leave microscopic tumor behind, then surgery is probably not an option. Take this example where you have a primary lung cancer, a contralateral lymph node that also harbors lung cancer, and the aorta in between. You can't just do a resection of the primary lung cancer and a resection of the positive lymph node if you want to achieve a surgical cure and offer your patient a chance at a survival benefit because cancer cells must have traveled directly from the primary lung cancer past the aorta to the lymph node. That means that microscopic tumor is in all likelihood present along the path between the primary lung cancer and the lymph node. A curative surgery can't leave microscopic tumor behind, which means a curative surgical resection would have to look like this. Now, obviously you can't excise a part of the aorta, so surgery would probably not be an option in a patient like this. Another example could be a situation where a primary lung cancer invades a structure like the pericardium. Surgical resection would um, need to achieve negative margins, leaving no microscopic tumor behind and re therefore require resection of a part of the heart, which is not feasible. And therefore, surgery would not be on the table as a treatment option. To get the negative margins you need to have a decent chance at accomplishing a surgical cure often means resecting a portion of adjacent anatomy. Some anatomic structures are resectable, while others, like the spine, heart, esophagus, trachea, and great vessels, are not. Resections that would theoretically require the removal of a portion of these unresectable structures would likely disqualify surgery as a treatment option. Fortunately, we have other treatment cards to play, such as radiation therapy. With radiation therapy, we use ionizing radiation high-powered x-ray beams to burn and kill cancer cells. Radiation therapy is a local, not systemic treatment. In order to kill as much of the cancer cells as possible, a bit of the normal tissue near the margins of the tumor also needs to be within the treatment field. This collateral damage can lead to symptoms and side effects. There are limits to how much cumulative radiation you can give a patient, and radiotherapy cannot be applied to large body regions. Chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is another strategy we have for killing cancer cells. Instead of surgically removing tumor tissue or burning tumor tissue to death, we introduce chemicals into the patient's bloodstream that interfere with the replication process of rapidly dividing cells in the body. This means killing cancer cells, but also collateral damage to normal rapidly replacing cell lines too, like the epithelium of the GI tract, for example, which can lead to some side effects. Chemotherapy goes wherever blood goes and is therefore a systemic, not a local therapy. Targeted therapy. Targeted therapies work differently from chemotherapy in that they sabotage proteins and genes specific to certain cancer cells. Proteins and genes the cancer cells need to parasitize the blood supply or um, metabolic processes they need to survive. Because these abnormal proteins and genes are usually absent from normal cells, Targeted therapies are associated with fewer side effects than something like chemotherapy. However, targeted therapies often only work in cancer cells with certain genetic mutations, 
And if that particular genetic mutation is not the same one in your patient's lung cancer, targeted therapy may not be a treatment option. Finally, our fifth treatment option is immunotherapy. Often lung cancer cells produce proteins that help them elude the immune system's attempts to kill them. With immunotherapy, we interfere with this process and amplify the immune system's attempts to attack the lung cancer. Side effects can sometimes occur. So these are all the cards we have to play when treating a patient's lung cancer. The best treatment plan may vary from case to case. It might be surgery for one patient, chemotherapy and immunotherapy for the next patient, surgery, radiotherapy, and chemotherapy for another patient. And the order in which multiple therapies are applied can vary too. There are a lot of different treatment plans available and knowing the stage of a patient's lung cancer allows oncologists to determine what the best treatment plan will be. The method by which we stage lung cancer may differ depending on if it's a small cell or a non-small cell lung cancer. Small cell lung cancers, which account for 15% of lung cancers, are staged bimodally as either limited stage or extensive stage. Limited stage small cell lung cancer cases are cases where the small cell lung cancer is, the only, is in only one part of the chest and can be safely treated with a single tolerable radiation portal. Extensive stage small cell lung cancer cases are cases where the small cell lung cancer involves multiple different parts of the body or cannot be safely treated with a single tolerable radiation portal. In other words, radiation therapy is an option for limited stage small cell lung cancers, but not an option for extensive stage small cell lung cancers. With regards to treatment plans, surgery is usually not an option as small cell lung cancers are usually very central and in close proximity to vital unresectable anatomy that would prevent you from achieving a negative margin safely. Small cell lung cancers tend to be aggressive and a combination of chemotherapy and radiation therapy are usually used for limited stage small cell lung cancers. With extensive stage small cell lung cancers, radiation is off the table and treatment plans may rely on chemotherapy or chemotherapy and immunotherapy. As radiologists, our role in staging small cell lung cancers is to provide the information needed to establish if a patient is limited or extensive stage. That means things like mentioning in our reports if there is one or more than one tumor region, where those tumor regions are, and how large those tumor regions are. Non-small cell lung cancers are much more common than small cell lung cancers, and their staging is more complex. Non-small cell lung cancers are staged into four buckets, numbered from one to four. From a big picture perspective, stage one non-small cell lung cancers are cases where the cancer is confined to the lung and has not spread to any lymph nodes or to any other parts of the body. Stage two non-small cell lung cancers have spread to and only to the ipsilateral hilar lymph nodes. Stage three non-small cell lung cancers have directly, are, um, have, um, directly spread beyond the lung or um, they've spread beyond the ipsilateral hilar lymph nodes to other uh, regional lymph nodes. Stage three non-small cell lung cancers have not metastasized though to more distant body parts like liver, bones, or brain. Stage four non-small cell lung cancers are cancers with distant metastases, including malignant pleural or pericardial effusions. The treatment plan for stage one non-small cell lung cancers are usually either surgery in isolation or surgery followed by chemotherapy, just in case a microscopic amount of lung cancer was left behind after the resection. Chemotherapy administered after surgery is referred to as adjuvant chemotherapy. The treatment plan for stage two non-small cell lung cancers are usually surgery and adjuvant chemotherapy. There are a wide variety of plans for stage three non-small cell lung cancers. Um, for example, some folks may be given chemotherapy to shrink the tumor before cancer surgery and then treated with radiotherapy after cancer surgery. We refer to chemotherapy administered before cancer surgery as neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Other folks might see a combination of chemotherapy and radiation therapy before surgery or surgery followed by chemotherapy and radiation. And in folks with stage three non-small cell lung cancer where surgery is not an option, 
uh, treatment plan plans could include um, something like chemotherapy and radiation therapy followed by immunotherapy. This treatment plan for stage four uh, non-small cell lung cancers will usually not include surgery for the reasons we alluded to earlier. Uh, with stage four non-small cell lung cancers, the goal is to control the cancer and do our best to manage it like a chronic disease, such as diabetes or HIV. We've got a number of different agents at our disposal. However, each has a limited period of efficacy and uh, amount that the patient could physically tolerate. So uh, we do our best to play the treatment cards in our deck as intelligently as possible in these folks. So there are four major staging buckets for non-small cell lung cancer, but as you can expect, the actual assignment of staging in real life is more complex, and we rely on a standardized system called the Tumor, Lymph Node, and Metastasis, or TNM staging system to bring more accuracy and consistency to the staging of non-small cell lung cancer. With the modern TNM system, the four major staging buckets are subdivided and assignment of stage is based on a combination of amount of primary tumor growth and invasion scored on a scale of one to four, um, the anatomic extent of regional lymph node involvement scored on a scale of zero to three, and the presence or absence of distant metastasis scored on a scale of zero to one. So if, for example, you had a patient whose primary tumor growth and invasion scored T2B, um, anatomical extent of regional lymph node involvement scored N1 with no distant metastasis, or M0, your patient be staged 2B, which would tell us that their two-year survival may be around 76% on average, their five-year survival may be around 56% on average, and that surgery followed by chemotherapy may be a typical first-line treatment plan for someone with non-small cell lung cancer with that particular amount of growth and spread. So what are the criteria for these T, N, and M scores? Well, T score assignment relies on the size of the primary tumor in its greatest dimension, and a bronchial extension, visceral chest wall or mediastinal invasion, and the presence of separate tumor sites in different lobes of the same lung. And these are the specific rules. In patients with no endobronchial involvement, no visceral mediastinal or chest wall invasion, and no tumor in another lobe of the same lung, T-scoring is based on different greatest tumor dimension thresholds between three centimeters and seven centimeters. In the presence of endobronchial involvement, or visceral pleural invasion, T-score will be no lower than T2. In the presence of chest wall invasion, T-scores will be no lower than T3. While the presence of mediastinal invasion or a separate tumor site in a different lobe of the same lung results in a T4 score regardless of primary tumor site size. Now let's talk about how we make these calls on imaging. Assessing the greatest dimension of the primary tumor is pretty easy on CT if the primary tumor is entirely surrounded by air-filled lung parenchyma. However, in cases where the tumor margins are obscured by a substantial amount of atelectasis or pneumonia, it's sometimes tough to figure out where tumor ends and the atelectasis or consolidation begins. And PET-CT imaging can offer a more accurate estimate of tumor size than CT. If you're really in a jam, MRI could potentially help, but it's relatively uncommon to see MRI used in this particular way. Bronchoscopy is probably the most accurate way of diagnosing endobronchial tumor extension. However, CT does offer a decent way of assessing the patency of the central airways and identifying overt cases of endobronchial tumor extension. CT can also flag cases when an, an uh, endoluminal opacity isn't diagnostic for fluid and might benefit from further investigation like bronchoscopy. There are several CT imaging features that are suggestive for visceral invasion by lung malignancy. Over 30 millimeters of contiguous tumor and pleural contact, obtuse angles at the edges of the tumor along the lung margin, or focal pleural thickening where the tumor meets the lung margin. 
Using the presence of at least two of these three features to call visceral pleural invasion can result in a sensitivity between 46 and 87 percent and specificity between 59 and 91 percent. Certainly not perfect, but better than a flip of a coin. Focal pleural puckering next to a tumor can sometimes suggest visceral pleural invasion. More involved guidelines have also been proposed in literature too, such as the calculation of a ratio between the amount of distance the tumor touches the lung margin and the tumor's maximal diameter, and seeing if it's over 0.9. The author of this particular technique claims that it's quite sensitive and specific. CT can identify cases of aortic chest wall invasion when bone destruction is visible. However, our ability to identify less overt cases of chest wall invasion is unreliable on most imaging modalities, whether it's CT, MRI, or PET-CT. Calling mediastinal invasion whenever lung tumor contacts the mediastinum can be unreliable. However, CT imaging findings such as overt replacement of mediastinal fat by tumor or encasement of a mediastinal vessel by tumor are pretty reliable signs of mediastinal invasion. However, at the end of the day, many chest radiologists believe that we're better at predicting the absence of mediastinal invasion than its presence. Mediastinal invasion is generally less likely in cases where the amount of contact between tumor and mediastinum is less than 30 millimeters. In cases where less than 90 degrees of the circumference of the aorta is in contact with the tumor. And when a fat plane is visible between the tumor and a mediastinal structure. While folks generally feel good when there's, say, less than 30 millimeters of mediastinal tumor contact, less than 90 degrees of aorta contact, or presence of a fat plane between tumor and mediastinal structure, just seeing violation of these criteria um, may not necessarily predict the presence of mediastinal invasion. With a combination of CT and PET-CT, we tend to be pretty good at identifying situations where a separate tumor is present in a different lobe of the same lung. So that's how the classification of tumor invasion and growth is handled on imaging. N-score assignment relies on the anatomic extent of lung cancer spread to lymph nodes. Has tumor reached local nodes, like the ipsilateral hilar lymph nodes? Has tumor reached ipsilateral regional that is, ipsilateral mediastinal lymph nodes. Has tumor reached contralateral regional or mediastinal lymph nodes? Or has tumor reached lymph nodes in the lower neck? And here's how lymph node scoring works. It's important to point out that lung cancer spread to any other lymph nodes, for example, axillary or diaphragmatic lymph nodes, would be considered distant metastasis and scored by the distant uh, distant uh, metastasis M category, and not the regional lymph node N category. As for scoring regional lymph nodes, if we say had a patient with a right-sided lung cancer, involvement of, but no further than, the ipsilateral intrapulmonary peribronchial or hilar lymph nodes would be scored N1. While lung cancer cases that have reached the ipsilateral mediastinal lymph nodes or subcarinal lymph nodes would be scored N2. And lung cancer cases that had reached the contralateral mediastinal lymph nodes or lower cervical lymph nodes on either side would be scored N3. Now, there's a lot of nuance when it comes to distinguishing N1 from N2 and N2 from N3 lymph node spread on CT imaging. That's beyond the scope of this presentation, but uh, covered in detail in my presentation on lung cancer staging and the IASLC lymph node map. So how do we determine if a lymph node is positive or not on non-invasive imaging like a CT scan? Uh, one option uh, people try is to use the short axis diameter of a lymph node um, in some sort of threshold like say 10 millimeters. Uh, although short axis diameter measurements are relatively objective, they're not a reliable discriminator of malignancy versus benignity. In a um, study a number of years ago now, three quarters of patients who were definitively N0 after surgical lymph node sampling 
had at least one lymph node over 10 millimeters in short axis diameter. At the same time, one in eight patients who were definitively N1 or N2 after surgical lymph node sampling did not have a single lymph node over 10 millimeters in short axis diameter. So when dealing with lymph nodes that aren't just bulkily enlarged on CT imaging, we often uh, need to consider a gestalt of things like size, shape, number, and even then, our accuracy for calling positive lymphadenopathy may be limited, which is why we often um, refer to FDG PET imaging, which tends to be a bit better, though not without its share of some false positives and false negatives too. Not surprisingly, um, direct sampling of some lymph nodes is sometimes required in patients. So this is how the classification of regional lymph node spread is handled. M score assignment relies on identifying distant metastases and will be paying attention to the contralateral lung, the pleura, solid organs like liver, adrenal glands, brain, and also the bones. For the purposes of prognosis and guiding treatment, the M1 category is subdivided. Metastases to the pleural space, pericardial space, or contralateral lung are subcategorized as M1A, while single extrathoracic metastases, or metastases to lymph nodes beyond the hyla mediastinum and lower neck, are subcategorized as M1B. Multiple extrathoracic metastases are subcategorized as M1C. Except in severe cases, CT imaging is relatively nonspecific for pleural metastasis. On the other hand, PET-CT PET is a pretty good test for pleural metastasis. Um, somewhat nonspecific, but quite sensitive. In fact, PET-CT is a lot more sensitive than thoracentesis, which has been reported to have false negative rates as high as 30 to 40%. The combination of CT and PET-CT um, are pretty good for identifying situations where a separate tumor is present in the contralateral lung. Enhanced abdominal CT imaging, MRI, and PET-CT are all relatively sensitive for picking up liver metastasis. Likewise, three-phase enhanced abdominal CT, MRI, and PET-CT are all relatively good at identifying adrenal metastases too. The story for detecting brain metastases is different, uh, where MRI substantially outperforms CT and PET-CT. Picking up brain metastases can be quite um, challenging on PET-CT since background FDG in uptake in normal lung is very high. As with brain metastases, CT imaging um, is also not particularly sensitive um, uh, when it comes to bone metastases. Um, on the other hand, PET-CT performs quite well identifying bone metastases with high sensitivity and specificity. While the sensitivity of traditional nuclear medicine bone scans are high, their specificity for uh, bone mounts is much lower than PET-CT. Finally, compared to most other imaging modalities and tests, PET-CT is very good at detecting distant unsuspected metastases elsewhere in the body uh, from non-small cell lung cancer. When it comes to assessing um, for distant metastases from non-small cell lung cancer, with the exception of brain metastases, PET-CT is practically a one-stop shop. That's a valuable tool that helps us classify the extent of distant metastases in patients with non-small cell lung cancer. But there is one more thing, and it has to do with how a patient's stage can change. Let's look at a patient's lung cancer journey. Everything begins with the diagnosis of lung cancer. The diagnosis is usually established um, by an incisional biopsy. Incisional biopsies are biopsies where a portion of an abnormal object is removed and sent to pathology. For lung cancer, this is usually some kind of needle biopsy, most often performed percutaneously by a radiologist or bronchoscopically by a pulmonologist. After a patient has been diagnosed with lung cancer, they're staged. Sometimes staging could require additional incisional biopsies, perhaps of an equivocal lymph node somewhere. The stage is what drives the patient's treatment plan. Something interesting can happen if the treatment plan involves surgical resection of the lung cancer. With 
surgical resection, the entire cancer and some surrounding tissue and lymph nodes are resected and sent to pathology, resulting in what folks refer to as an excisional biopsy specimen. Excisional biopsies are biopsies where the entire abnormal object is surgically excised and sent to pathology. Using politics as a metaphor, an excisional biopsy is like all of the votes cast on an election day. Compared to an incisional biopsy would be like a small survey poll done on a sample of the electorate. Just as on some election nights, sometimes we learn something unexpected from the excisional surgical specimen than what we had expected going in. If we learn something unexpected, we may need to revise the patient's staging, which can impact the patient's treatment plan and prognosis downstream of the surgical resection. In order to clearly distinguish between the original stage and this revised stage, we refer to the original stage in patients like this as their clinical stage, and we refer to the updated stage after cancer surgery as their pathological stage. Clinical stages are preceded by the prefix C, while pathological stages are preceded by the prefix P. This isn't the end of the story though. Some patients may require neoadjuvant therapy before their cancer surgery. In these folks, it's sometimes useful to know what the patient's updated clinical stage is after neoadjuvant therapy has been given, but before their cancer surgery. This updated clinical stage is called the patient's post-neoadjuvant therapy stage and indicated by a prefix Y before their stage. So for this patient, their C TNM stage is derived from their initial staging workup. Their YC TNM stage is derived from the restaging workup after their neoadjuvant therapy but before their cancer surgery. And their YP TNM stage emerges after their cancer surgery. In patients who require cancer surgery but don't require neoadjuvant therapy, there's just a C TNM stage before cancer surgery and a P TNM stage after cancer surgery. And if their treatment plan doesn't include cancer surgery at all, there's no excisional biopsy and there's just a single TNM stage before therapy begins.